Good evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this special forum of the Washtenaw County Democratic Party. This evening, we will have two panels, both with candidates who will be on the ballot in the August 2nd primary election. Uh, I'm Eli Nathans, and I will be the moderator for both panels. The first panel will focus on the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners primary election in District 2. Uh, the, the candidate who will speak tonight is Crystal Light. I'm trying to tell you that Stephen Mancini, the other Democratic candidate in this race, is unable to join us. I, I regret that. We did invite him. Uh, the second panel uh, will feature candidates for the 14A district court position. I will tell you a bit more about that uh, race uh, when, the pan when that panel starts. I'd like now to turn the meeting over to Crystal Light, who will make an opening statement. Thank you. I currently am employed uh, with social services, um, with employment. And formerly, I was a high school English teacher. So I, I've had my way around the world of helping people in different uh, areas. I am also the chair of the Eastern Washtenaw Democratic Club. And I am the co-chair of the voice committee with the Washtenaw County Democratic Party. Uh, I am a mommy of a nine-year-old and a three-year-old and a wife to my wonderful husband. So that is me. Um, I would like to um, proudly um, and greatly say that I am endorsed um, by our Washtenaw County Sheriff, uh, Mr. Jerry Clayton, and by um, eight of the county commissioners, uh, along with others um, that have entrusted and believe that um, I will become a great county commissioner. So that is me, Crystal Light. Thank you so much, Ms. Light. Uh, I now am going to pose a number of questions. I, I circulated them both to Ms. Light and to Mr. Rancini. Um, and then after the after I pose a few questions, I will ask questions from the uh, from the audience. Um, so I'd like to first start with. Um, screen sharing and ask about a flyer that has been distributed uh, in hundreds, perhaps even thousands of households in this district. Um, as described at some length in a July 6th MLive article, a group called Make Michigan Great Pack has sent this flyer to voters in, this, in District 2, urging Republicans to support Stephen Rancini. The group claims in the flyer to speak for Washington Republicans. It refers to our values and agenda. Uh, it notes his con Mr. Rancini's $1,000 contribution to the Trump inaugural, and that he has given $15,000 to Republican candidates in the past. The suggestion that the flyer um, speaks for Washington Republicans, however, is false. The flyer, in fact, is the product of a group that opposes Mr. Rancini and is posing as Washington, Washington, Washington Republicans. The flyer suggests that Mr. Rancini supported President Trump's, former President Trump's uh, candidacy. In fact, he was a delegate for Hillary Clinton at the Democratic National Convention, and my strong sense is that he supported Hillary Clinton during that race. Um, so I'd like to start off by asking Ms. Light, what is your response to this flyer? Well, um, I received the flyer uh, in the mail as well. Um, it was surprising. Um, I had received some calls from several individuals um, inquiring if I had known that this was going to be issued or um, if I had something to do with it. Um, and I must first say that um, I do not condone or tolerate um, anything that would hurt myself or my opponent. Um, I am running for county commissioner so that because I want to, to help and because I want to be a county commissioner um, and I never do things um, disorderly um, or that may hurt someone or harm someone. So I, I first must say that I did not know um, and I was not aware that um, this occurred um, and I don't condone, condone any kind of messiness um, per se as to win a seat or to win a position or anything. Um, it was definitely shocking and I could see that it may be confusing to some um, as the way it read. Um, however, um, I am, like I said, I'm the chair of the Eastern Washington Democratic Party Club, and I am the co-chair on the voice committee with the Washington Dems. And 
um, you know, I do not want uh, the impression from anyone to think that I am attached to or anyone else or anything that organization that I am part of um, is connected to that. So I believe that um, that was done to to inform individuals um, of the of that pack's thoughts or um, what they may have alleged of what he um, may have contributed. Um, but I just for me, that's not something that I would do. Um, it's not something that I condone. I, I feel that um, that is something that is beyond my control. Um, and, you know, I just, it, it made it not just unfortunate for, for him, for, for my opponent, but it also made it unfortunate for myself because I had to explain to individuals that, you know, I don't condone um, anything that is going to hurt or harm someone, or I did not put that out there. And I'm not concerned about the contributions of my opponent. I'm not concerned about what he's done in the past. Um, it, it doesn't have anything to do with my campaign. So I'm focused on winning the seat. I know that I am a true dem, but I, like I said, I don't condone bashing uh, my opponent or I don't think that any other should do so. Um, I'm not sure, like I said, I'm not sure how, or I was surprised. So I just, I hope, um, that, you know, uh, uh, voters and residents do not feel that this was something that, um, was initiated, um, or projected from myself or from my committee because it wasn't. Um, and I wish my opponent the, the best, um, and he can only speak for, um, himself, himself uh, about um, the allegations or the contributions that may have been made. Thank you very much. Um, I did, in fact, I wish that Mr. Rancini were here to respond as well. But I would like to pose a question which I, I prepared for Mr. Rancini. And unfortunately, we're not going to hear an answer, but I think the question still should be posed. So assuming had he been here, I would have asked, what is your response to Democrats who are concerned that your past contributions to Republican candidates and in particular, the December 2016 donation to former President Trump's inaugural, not his candidacy, but his inaugural, suggests that you will not support the Democratic Party's positions on subjects such as the need to protect access to the ballot, the duty of the state of Michigan to provide and fund a quality public education for students in the primary grades, gun control, access to abortion, and more generally commitment to the rule of law and democratic principles. Um, as I say, I regret it's not here to answer that question. Now, I see there are members of the audience who've raised their hands. And so I'd like to, instead of asking the, the questions that I have, I'm going, to, I'm going to turn the floor over to the audience. I should also say there apparently is a professional development, uh, uh, sorry, a precinct delegate meeting going on at roughly the same time. And Teresa Reed has asked me to inform you of that. Okay. Um, and um, you can find the link to that in the, the first, um, it's in the chat. Uh, or if, if you have problems accessing that, then I would suggest um, just going to the Washington County Democratic Party um, website. Yes, I, I think I think the problem is you can't see the chat, but I can see the chat. You you can. The, the panelists, mm -hmm. but the audience can. I've 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 limited the oh. chat because in fact we have received some Zoom bombing, and it's important that this this be conducted in a civil fashion. Uh, I understand that you are a um, an employee of the county. Should you be elected to county commissioner, or will you still be keeping your employment with the county? So I am not an employee of the county. Uh, I work uh, for a partner um, of the county. So the program that I work for is 100% federally funded. And so um, it has been brought to the attention of my employer um, and myself, that if I do um, become uh, elected, if I do win the primary and to continue, um, and then in November, if I do um, win in the in the general, um, then no, I will not be able to continue my employment. So um, that is that is what is occurring right now. Um, I am currently um, on an unpaid leave, and um, and will do so until after the general. So thank you for the correction. And again, I commend you for doing this. As you know, um, public servants don't get paid a whole lot. So this really shows your commitment to the community. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Susan. I I'm going to ask a few questions. I'm very sorry about the, the Zoom bombing. This is actually, believe it or not, the first time in my experience running Democratic Party meetings for five years that that has happened. Um, so I, I am able to exclude using webinar tools, people who misuse the public forum, and that's what I've done. And so here's, here's my question for some further question for you. How much independence from the Board of Commissioners should the Road Commission have? So, on, on, for example, in the past, on subjects like decisions to cut trees to increase road safety, uh, which, um, about which there was some controversy, uh, apparently there were some differences between the Road Commission and certain members of the Board of Commissioners. Is this something that you have views on? Um, I don't have, uh, I would like to do more research. However, I do know that the two are two separate entities. Um, so I know that the Board of Commission and the Road Commission, um, you, it's a line drawn and, and the Board of Commission is not able um, to make those decisions, I should say. Um, so it would have to be talked amongst the board. Um, and then to further, you know, discuss and to, I guess we could suggest um, to the road commission, but it's not something to my knowledge right now. Like I said, I, I would need further, um, further knowledge of what those lines are and um, being that they are two separate entities. Um, so, but it would have to be discussed amongst the board and then suggested then on how we would move forward um, with any issue between the two. Great. Thank you. Um, let me ask about a, a clearly a burning issue in your district and for the entire county, and that is the cost of housing. Now, the, the, the Board of Commissioners' powers are limited, but they are not completely powerless. And so the question is, what do you think the Board of Commissioners can do to improve the quality of low-cost housing and, in general, to um, uh, make sure that, that residents who want to live in the county are able to do so? So yes, that is, it is a challenge for our county um, all over. Uh, so what would happen is um, the board of commission would have to, um, let's start with like a lot of low income housing or income based housing um, are owned privately. So that right there is also something where um, it has the, the hands of the board of commission tied because of the private, it's a private owned um, for instance, in Superior Township, um, there is income-based housing, um, but it is privately owned and it's not even owned by HUD. They still have to go along with the guidelines of housing of the Housing Commission. Um, however, the Board of Commission is not able um, to implement or to push um, policies against those private um, owners. However, um, there is a way um, where there's a will, there's a way the Board of Commission uh, can work with our Ypsilanti Housing Commission or our Ann Arbor Housing Commission to make sure um, that they um, are pushing the Housing Commission to make sure that those private owners are meeting the standards um, for housing as far as the living conditions and as far as um, pricing. Also, um, the the board would be able to implement policies where maybe we can find um, available land for housing. Um, so just helping initiating um, and advocating would be the most, um, as far as I know right now, um, until I'm in the seat, I won't know all of the specifics, but um, doing the advocating and implementing the policies and making sure um, that we are helping as much as we can, um, even though we're not able to enforce or to, uh, to push policy, but just doing just that. Thank you very much. Now, what I'm going to do, um, since this, this meeting is being Zoom bombed, um, is, is I'm going to open up um, further questions in chat. So okay. anyone who wants to post a, post a question can um, send, me an, send me a message in chat. And if, if I think it's a legitimate question, sorry, I'm not going to have to make that choice myself. I will, I will consider posing it. So that's, that's to those in the audience who've raised their hands, that's how I'm going to proceed. And the, the webinar format permits me to exercise that authority. So in the meantime, as you compose your questions, um, let me ask another question uh, regarding, regarding the policies of the Board of Commissioners. What steps should it take to monitor the performance of agencies that receive American Rescue Plan funding? So my, my sense is that most of these dollars will have been uh, 
allocated by the time the new commissioners are elected. But um, nonetheless, the commission has the responsibility of making sure that they're well spent. Okay. And so um, do you have any thoughts about how, how this should be monitored? Um, well, I, um, I know that there's a process um, anytime any funds come into the state and to a county. Um, so I would imagine that the board has already went through a strategic process um, on where the funds have been allocated or where they're going to be allocated now that they're there. Um, and once they are dispersed, um, I know that, you know, they're just not saying, okay, we're just going to give money to these people and these people. So each, any organization or any agency that receives the funds, um, I'm sure they've went through a process to show what the results, what they're going to produce, um, what, what the funds are going to be used for. And that's why they were given. So with that, um, I, I would like for the board to be able, they will monitor um, with the production, with what they've been given in the beginning. This is what this if the agency says, this is what we're going to give. This is what we're going to produce. This is what's going to be illustrated. Um, this is going to be the return of investment. So that's just what the board will do. They will monitor and make sure that what was in the beginning that it is carried out um, and they will make sure that they produce what was um, on why they requested the funds. And so, and I, and I, I trust that the board is going to do just that. They're going to monitor and make sure that they get results. Thank you very much. Um, it's, but I mean, having this much money given to the board by the federal government, it's, it's not the typical kind of way that way the board is operated. It's, it's an unusual moment. So I, I expect that not everything is kind of prepared, so to speak. But mm -hmm. I, I, I know that the the board is is working on on this question of monitoring. In fact, is required to do so by apparently federal law. Yes. Um, I have not received any questions from those members of the audience who apparently are here to actually learn from you. Um, but I want to I want to offer them one more opportunity. If um, if I recognize you, I will call on you. If you want to ask a question in chat. Um, I will ask the question. Ask you to type the question in chat. Um, my sense is most of those who were here to Zoom bomb have left us. Thank you, Zoom webinar. All right, I don't. I don't see any questions from the audience. Hand no hands up. Um, so I will ask my last question. And that is concerns economic development. Um, this is something once again the Board of Commissioners' powers. Are limited, but again, I'd, I'd like to know what what do you think the Washington County government can do to promote economic development in the county? Um, so, as we spoke before, as uh, with the housing, um, I think that if we are able to house our residents, so if the board is able um, to come up with um, a policy or implement something for housing. Um, which we don't, you know, it won't be where we can say, hey, this is what we're going to have. But if residents um, or citizens are housed, then they're able to work. They're able to be educated. Uh, and that way, if they're able to be housed and they can work and educate, then they can go into um, their marketable. So if they're marketable and they're able to work, then they're able to put back into our communities. So if we're able to give them a foundation, um, because nothing starts without a foundation. Um, everything begins um, with some leveling. It, it's like, you know, if we're building a house or if we're building um, anything that we are putting together, it has to have a foundation. So if there's a strong foundation um, and the board implements and makes that foundation and we start to build from the foundation up, everything is going to revolve and it's going, we're going to put back into our community and that's going to grow. Um, and economically we will grow. So we have to build a foundation and we have to make sure that um, we can, like I said, house our citizens and our residents, employ them and educate them. And then they can put back into our community and we'll grow. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. I'd like to now give you a chance to make a closing statement. I am so honored and um, glad to be able to run for county commissioner. Um, this has been very exciting and interesting um, as this is my first time running for a political position. However, um, through 
there was a question asked earlier today about uh, me having to take a leave from work. Um, and I still am standing strong and I am still running because I want to help individuals. Um, I want to be able to make a change in the community, in the county. Um, and if we make changes by starting in our community, in our county, it's going to help a state. And then it's going to go beyond that. So I am here not just as a stepping stone to move up in the political world, but I want to be um, available in, to the community and to advocate and to make sure that my children are able to grow up um, in a county uh, where there is going to be adequate life. Um, I am just ecstatic and I can't wait till August 2nd, actually August 3rd, because then we'll know when what the results are um so i'm just continuing to ask individuals to support um to vote for me on august 2nd um to visit my website electcrystallight.com um and just remember that we have to vote um we have to get blue seats it's not just about um not just about district two it's about all the districts we need to get blue seats so that we can continue um to, to have our rights because they will be gone. So we want to make sure that we have our reproductive rights. We want to make sure that we're able to vote. And the only way that we can do that is if everyone votes. So please and thank you in advance. Make sure August 2nd you do just that. And thank you for having me. Thank you for so much for participating in this panel and for um, your, your answers to the question posed. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'd like now to now move to the second panel. Um, and I'd like to ask um, the four candidates for the District Court 14A position to unmute themselves and to you can display themselves on the video. Um, you know, I'd just like to provide a little bit of background. Um, so th this, this the, the court for which you are running, and the candidates can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, covers all district court matters for Washtenaw County, except for the city of Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti Township. In, in this uh, primary, there'll be four names on the ballot and all four individuals are here with us. Um, the two top vote getters will then appear on the November ballot. Uh, so you will need this information both in August and in November. And that's why we're having this discussion now. I would also like to um, point out that the League of Women Voters had a very informative forum with these candidates uh, I think about a month ago, it's available on YouTube. So essentially, if you go to YouTube and you search for, I just did it, I'll leave it today, uh, League of Women Voters and District 14A panel, it pops up. Um, and I, I purposely am not going to ask questions that repeat the questions posed at that panel, uh, because there are other questions we can focus on. So this panel is going to have a somewhat different focus. I just think it's better use of time. Um, let me then let me begin now by discuss, dis describing sort of the rules of engagement. Um, each of the panelists will have five minutes uh, to make an opening statement. This is much longer than the League of Women Voters provided, and I've I've given this time because I want them to have a chance to discuss their own past careers. Each of these candidates has roughly twenty years of legal experience in the area. They have a a very you could say rich, interesting background. We're, we're fortunate to have such candidates running for this position. And I think you should get a chance to learn a bit more about them. So that's one. Um, the, the statements we made in alphabetical order by last name. So in this case, A, B, C, F. Um, I will then pose a few questions um, and I will start, I will again continue using alphabetical order, except instead of starting with Ms. Armstrong, I will start, pose the first question first to Mr. Barr. They will be answered in alphabetical order and proceed with the next question the same way. After I, each pan panelist will have two minutes to answer each question. Uh, and at the end of this, um, the question period, there'll be a chance for closing statements, which will also be made in alphabetical order following the, the cycle of questions. Now, I have a timer here who's a professional at this. She happens to be my spouse. Um, and um, at, when there are 30 seconds left, you will hear a very small chime, something like that. When time is up, you'll hear a more insistent chime. I'm sure none of you will have to hear what happens after that. You don't, you don't want to. It's, 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 it's a very disturbing bell. Okay, that's, that's the basic scheme maneuver. Um, 
And I, I would like to then now open the floor up to um, Ms. Armstrong. You have five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you holding this for voters to have as much information as possible um, before they, they cast their votes. Uh, good evening. My name is Fawn Armstrong. I'm running for 14A District Court Judge. I've been a prosecutor here in the county for the past 10 years. I also have prior experience uh, in working with a civil law firm. I'm also prior service. I did eight years in the Army Reserves. I did one tour of duty in Iraq. That was in August of five to August of six. I'm also a mother. I have a 13 year old daughter. She goes to Celine Middle School. I'm recently married. My husband is a criminal defense attorney. As district court judge, I hope to bring, um, I, or I plan to bring hope to the bench. A lot of time people commit crimes and it's a call for help. It's substance abuse issues, mental health issues, it's financial issues, housing issues, it's potentially bad childhoods, the, the lack of having mentors in their lives. Uh, I believe that we can treat people and heal them uh, with rehabilitation, with programming. I think that if you believe in someone, that they can get that from them for themselves and believe in themselves. It's something that when I was at basic training uh, in the in the military, I didn't realize how much inner strength I had, and and I think that we can give that to people too, and they don't know how much they can accomplish in life. And I really hope that every time you're or if someone commits a crime, it doesn't have to be a stigma attached to them for the rest of their lives. It can be something they can grow from and move on from and become better people for. I think that each sentence, how you treat each case, each person needs to be individualized. I think that we can give support, give second chances, take into consideration those struggles that people are really going through in their lives in every single order and decision the court makes. I think that uh, gives hope to people. And as district court judge, I hope to answer that call for help and, and give that hope and belief. I'm also hoping to do a, a specialty court. We have a lot of amazing specialty courts, problem solving courts in this county, um, but none in 14A. We have mental health court, veterans court, um, and, and uh, drug courts, sobriety courts, in the district courts of 14B, 15th, and also in the 22nd district court, and not one in 14A. And these are huge for people um, because they can give motivation uh, for people to really follow the program so that they can have long-term recovery. It also gives amazing benefits. If they complete everything, they can have their cases dismissed or their, or reduced uh, in terms of sobriety court. Uh, we can get them their license back quicker so that they can drive and, and go to job, go to their jobs and uh, support themselves and their family. So I think it is, is so, so important. It also uh, brings together a whole team of people to support uh, that individual on, on various levels. So say in the instance of Veterans Court, you have people there, social workers, people who are familiar with the federal system and can help them with filling out those forms to get their benefits uh, so they, they can get uh, money, housing, things like that. It's, it's just a complete support of a person uh, to help them succeed in life. And I think it would be huge um, for the people of 14A in this community. So I, I thank you so much for your time. Again, uh, Fawn Armstrong, I have a website, fawnarmstrongforjudge.com. If you um, want to look me up also on Facebook, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out uh, and hopefully I can answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Barr. Thank you. My name is Carl Barr. I'm a candidate for 14A District Court. Some have asked, why am I here? Why am I running? And the simple answer is, I was asked. I was surprised when Judge Tabby reached out in March, indicated he was going to retire and he would support me to take his place. So a little more about myself, my roots and ties, the community run very deep. And this is just one of the many reasons why I'm the best candidate to represent this community as the next judge in 14A District Court, but specifically this would be in 14A2 District Court, which is in the city of Ypsilanti. I'm the only candidate that grew up and attended the school system within the 14A2 District Court. I attended Perry School, Fletcher Elementary, West Middle School, and Ypsilanti High School. I graduated from Northern Michigan University and 
Michigan State College of Law. I'm a father and partner to Kaylee Garcia. My oldest child is at U of M. My youngest will be a junior at Skyline in Ann Arbor. I currently live in Scio Township and have been working at Bar and Hutton Associates in Ypsilanti for the past 22 years. I'm an Eagle Scout. My Eagle project was cleaning up the Huron River Bank in downtown Ypsilanti. I'm a past committee chair of Troop 7 and past board member of Ypsilanti Meals on Wheels and past board member of the Washtenaw 100 Club. I'm the only candidate who has prosecuted criminal def offenses, defended criminal offenses, as well as handled both sides of civil matters in the 14A District Court. I'm the only candidate that has worked in and served the 14A2 community for more than 20 years. As an assistant city attorney, I've cleaned up over a dozen nuisance properties in the city of Ypsilanti. I've created the Administrative Hearings Bureau, aka the Blight Court. I've drafted countless ordinances and uh, currently assisting the city in bringing a 300 unit affordable and senior housing project on Clark Road to address the um, housing issues, the lack of housing, as well as a 56 unit affordable condo unit on North Park Street. I'm the only candidate endorsed by the outgoing judge, Kirk Tabby, who knows the most about the 14A2 district court and the needs of that community. I'm endorsed by other judges, attorneys, and city leaders in Ypsilanti. Those endorsing me, and I think this is important, have known me and my work product for over 20 years. My top goal is to rebuild trust between the community and the judicial system. It is of the utmost importance that the citizens of this community be heard and get fair treatment in my courtroom. I will expand the use of specialty court programs to focus on rehabilitation, community support, and the reduction of recidivism. I would like to reestablish the bench bar. The bench bar was a regular meeting between the court, the police, municipal officials, prosecutor, and the defense bar. This opens communication about procedural and community issues so that everyone involved knows each other's roles, knows what challenges each department is facing, and can work together in a collaborative way. This way, the community is best protected and their concerns are heard. As your next judge, I'll be keenly aware that it is my job to protect a, con a defendant's constitutional rights and keep victims in the community safe. I believe in addressing the racial disparity in sentencing and reducing recidivism are, is pri a priority for this court. With regards to the racial disparity in sentencing, as your judge in 14A2, I would conduct a yearly equity audit to give transparency to the fact that I will be a trusted and fair judge for all. And I would like to thank Commissioner Caroline, who I know you are supporting one of my opponents, but that idea originated from a conversation that you and I had. With regards to recidivism, I plan to enact specialty courts to treat the true cause of the defendant's problems. Once the root cause is addressed, a person is much less likely to reoffend. It is vitally important that the public have trust and respect for the judicial system and that the law is applied equally. I'll conduct myself and the court in a manner that will be create trust and respect. For instance, it is important for a court to produce fair and partial decisions. Decisions should include thoughtful reasoning and the law relied on for the result. I believe in the Constitution and the rule of law. The rule of law is a set of principles and ideas for ensuring an orderly and just society and that no one is above the law. I also believe in equitable justice for all, a concept where everyone is treated fairly and equally under the law, everyone is held accountable to the same laws and there are clear and fair processes for enforcing laws. There's an independent judiciary and human rights are guaranteed for all. I uh, appreciate this opportunity. I've been having so much fun during this campaign. Uh, anyone wants to reach out to me, uh, my phone number is 734-218-4582. And that's not just a campaign phone number, but that's my phone number. Uh, my website is, Carl, or is um, Carl Barr, for judge, F -O -R judge com. Uh, thank you again. Please vote for me on August 2nd and November 8th. Thank you very much, Mr. Collis. Hello, everyone. My name is Stuart Collis. I am a litigator with 26 years of experience. I am the most experienced candidate on this panel. I am also the only candidate on this panel that does practice actively in all aspects that a district court judge will do. I do traffic. I do small claims, I do landlord tenant, I do civil matters under $25,000 in value, I do criminal misdemeanors, and I have done felonies all the way up to life offenses. Though the life offenses, of course, and felonies are not handled at the district court other than for preliminary exams in order to determine whether there's probable cause in the order to move the case up. So I've been in the courtroom every single day, practically for 26 years. 
I am a resident of Saline. I've been in Washtenaw County for 20 years. I've been on and off before that in Washtenaw County as a U of M graduate from uh, 1991 with my BA and a Cooley Law graduate in 1995. I'm licensed not only in the state of Michigan, but I'm also licensed in Illinois and New York. Uh, I have practiced in both states from Michigan. Uh, I've been a lifelong Michigan resident, uh, but for reasons uh, that are familial related, I, I also got into those bars. I'm also licensed in five federal courts. Uh, I've been published number of times in um, several legal journals. I've been published in the Michigan Veterinary Medical Association, the American um, Avian Association's newsletters. Uh, I've also been published in the Washington Area Department Association. I've been published as um, in the Detroit, Washtenaw, and other legal news on issues regarding small claims. I've been a presenter before ICL. Uh, so I have quite a grand amount of experience that I would be bringing to this bench that is all relevant for the bench. In Celine, I live with my wife, who is a former Pontiac police officer. Uh, we have two children. One, uh, one of them is an entering 10th grader at Celine High School. The other is an entering 7th grader at Celine Middle School. Um, the 14A District Court um, needs a judge that is going to be fair and equitable uh, to all parties that come before them. And, and no one should be afraid to come to the court. Um, we are in a position right now where the court is unbalanced for a number of different reasons. It's unbalanced in the civil system um, where individuals come before the court and when they don't have an attorney because you're not entitled to a court-appointed attorney, they're at an unfair advantage in the system. And one of the things that I want to bring to the court system is a task force to help these unrepresented people to balance the scales of justice. Similarly, I am really concerned about the criminal system, as mentioned by Ms. Armstrong, uh, and I think that all of us uh, candidates uh, have said the same thing. We all want specialty courts in 14A district court. It's embarrassing that we cover the largest amount of territory in Washtenaw County and yet 15th District Court, which is Ann Arbor, has sobriety court, veterans court, um, and a mental health court. 14B, a one-judge court, has a sobriety court. And 14A, which has three judges and covers the remainder of the county, has none of them. It is, it, it's, it's an embarrassment to our society, and we need to correct that. The other thing that we need to correct is that we need to correct the small claim system. In 14A District Court, that system is geared such that there's mediation first, which is a really great thing, but the parties then have to come back at later dates and times to come back before a magistrate and maybe later again before a judge. And at any point in time, these cases can be removed from the small claims docket to the general docket, further elongating what should be a one day process. I value people's time. I value their effort that they're putting into the system. And when, the one good thing that came out of the pandemic is that we got technology into the courtroom and we need more of it to make the burden on the ordinary individual much less. Because when we see people in the court system and they're forced to take time off of work, that means that's less days off for sick time, less days off for vacation time, and maybe they can't afford it and eventually that puts them out on the street. That's not fair. We need to make sure that these people are in and out of the court system efficiently and in a way that benefits all parties, uh, so it's fair for all everyone. <laughs> if you need more information, obviously you'll hear some more on this panel. Of course, my website is electstuartcollis.org. On Facebook, it is also electstuartcollis. I'll be happy for more input, and you can contact me at either one of those. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Collis. Mr. Feaster. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Torsho Feaster, and like everyone else, I'm an attorney here in uh, Washington County. Uh, I currently work for the Public Defender's Office, and I am fortunate and blessed and thankful to be able to run for this opportunity here for 14A District Court. Uh, let me start out by saying I am endorsed by a number of great people and organizations. I am currently endorsed by Planned Parenthood, 
by AFSCME, by the uh, Democratic Black Caucus, by the Vanzetti uh, Bar Association. I'm also endorsed by the two judges who will be remaining on the 14A District Court, Judge Freshour and Judge Simpson, as well as uh, the Chief Judge of the 22nd Circuit Court, Judge Kunke, Judge Conlin, Judge Vandenberg, and Judge Connors, in addition to the 14B District Court Judge, Judge Washington. And the County Sheriff, Jerry Clayton, is also endorsing me. So I am very thankful to have so much support in this county, uh, the people who have uh, uh, have supported me and uplifted me have been amazing, and I am excited about the opportunity to uh, serve them and serve this community and live up to the trust they've put into in my name. Um, I am I've been an attorney for over fifteen years, and when I went into criminal defense work, uh, the idea that I had was to try to put myself out of business, and what I mean by that is that uh, I have far too many repeat clients. And what I realized during that my first 14 years in private practice is that clients continue to come through the system over and over again. And we do a good job at finding them and putting them in jail, but we don't often do a great job of addressing the why. And so my goal is to be able to address that why. Uh, I think the main reasons are uh, mental health, substance abuse, lack of education, and lack of employment. And so I want to put together programming that can really address those those issues, because I'm tired of seeing the same people come to the system over and over again, and our community is only going to be as strong as the people who we uplift who are struggling. And so that's why I want to serve in this role. As a defense attorney, I'm able to touch maybe 50 people a day. As a judge, I can touch double that or triple that. Uh, I am someone who's been in this community on and off for a number of years. I am an Eastern Michigan University graduate. Uh, I have worked for student legal services here at the University of Michigan. I worked for the jury clerk here when I was an undergraduate. And now I work, like I said, as a public defender. And I've had a lot of time here in this county because my wife has been here for 20 of the last 21 years as a medical student, uh, an undergraduate student, a medical student, a resident, and now as an attending physician at the University of Michigan Hospital, where she is an OBGYN. And so we're happy to be here to raise our two daughters and to try to make this community as great as possible. Uh, what, my what my colleagues have said is about specialty courts and that we need to increase the specialty courts we have in this county. And I agree with that. And I think my track record shows that I'm someone who believes in that because I, I have created specialty courts in the past. I have created a homelessness court with the purpose of getting people off of the street. I have helped to create a blight court to clean up a community that was struggling from dumping and people not, pay, not maintaining their properties. I've served as a judge of that blight court and a judge of the teen jury program, which was a program to address our youth who come through the system and to try to make sure that we redirect them before they get going down the wrong path. These are things that I want to institute here. These are programs I want to bring to 14A to make our community better. And so I'm excited about that possibility. I'm looking forward to serving the community. Uh, like I always say, I'm a lawyer. I can talk all day. So I'm not going to take up my full five minutes. I just want to say thank you to the Democratic Party for having me. I'm looking forward to answering these questions. And if the audience has questions, I want to leave as much time as possible for them to ask us the questions they have. So thank you all for having me. Thank you very much, Mr. Feaster. Um, I do have a number of questions, but actually, I believe that those who are interested in Zoom bombing this meeting have left. And so I'm going to open up the floor to questions from the audience. And if there are none, I, I will ask the questions I have. But I, I do, one of the differences between the League of Women Voters forums and our panel is that we ask, we give the audience a chance to ask questions directly. Um, no one is asking any quite yet, so I will pose a couple. When do you think a car incarceration is appropriate? When do you think it is inappropriate? And I'd like to start with Mr. Barr. Well, thank you. The question of whether incarceration is appropriate leaps over several other lesser alternatives in sentencing, some of which have been detailed in other forums. As many of you know, I intend to create a substance abuse court, mental health court, and veterans court in the 14A district court. Please note that if I am unable to find grant funding, I will need, and I'm now asking for public support, as in order for this to be most successful, it would entail further appropriation from the, to the court's budget from the county board of commissioners. I expect my municipal law experience and 
assisting in grant applications and requesting legislation from elected boards will give me an advantage as your next district court judge in achieving that goal to its fullest. There are several theories of sentencing, some being retribution for the victim, rehabilitation for the offender, deterrence, and incapacitation. Incarceration falls under incapacitation as the most severe penalty. When is incarceration appropriate? Well, when there's a demonstrated safety threat to the community, when there's repeat, repeated hurtful offenses, whereas other lesser alternatives have been unsuccessful in rehabilitation. Note, however, the analysis should not be oversimplistic. This theory, when applied simply, is how the sentencing guidelines and repeat offenses have caused huge racial disparity in the amount of blacks in prison due to sentence enhancement. If anyone listening has not already reviewed the crew report, please do. And that's a Citizens for Racial Equity in Washington. One of my goals when I'm elected is to hold a yearly audit of sentencing to further ensure and furthermore communicate the fairness to the public and that they are confident and trust what is happening within my court. This will be one of the many ways in, in I intend to build trust and confidence between the community and the judicial system. When is it inappropriate? Well, when there's young, impressionable, sometimes transitional people in divorce uh, and first offenders. I'd like to note that most offenders are good people who have made a bad decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Collis. Well, I'll, I'll start with the, the big answer first. Incarceration should be the last resort uh, as a general rule. Uh, the district court has only the power to um, sentence up to one year in jail. It can't sentence to prison. It can't sentence to uh, anything longer than one year. And the maximum amount of uh, probation, except in special circumstances, is two years. So we have basically two years in many cases in which to work with individuals, try to help them avoid the system. And a lot of the reasons that incarceration should be the last resort is that even right now in the law, even without the sobriety court and the veterans court and the mental health court, which are all important and should be used, uh, we have still a lot of programs that are statutory, which are within the law that also are encouraging us to work with individuals like the Holmes Youthful Training Act, which is uh, uh, abbre abbreviated as HIDA. Uh, we have 769-4A uh, for domestic violence, so first offenders can get the assistance that they need uh, through a probationary period. We have uh, 3411, which is for first uh, offense drug offenses. So there's a lot of ways in the court system to avoid that incarceration. The only time that it, like I said, that incarceration should be used is as the last resort when nothing else is going to work. And it's for the protection of society because we don't want people in society to be harming society. We want the entire purpose of the district court, which I view as more like a people's court, is to try and assist people, try to help people, try to bring them into conformity with what societal standards are. And if we can't do that, then incarceration is the only result. And unfortunately, that's a bad answer for most of the time. Thank you very much. Mr. Feaster. Thank you. Uh, obviously, there, there's two times when you have to look at the situation at a district court level. You have to look at it when it comes to bond. You have to look at it when it comes to sentencing. As it relates to bond, uh, there are two, two considerations that a judge has to take, to take when he decides if someone's going to be incarcerated. And that's whether that person is likely to appear at court and whether that person is a danger to the community. And so what we have to do is balance those two considerations and determine whether or not the person should be incarcerated pending their, the result or resolution of their case. The other time is when at, at sentencing and or, or, or yes, during, during sentencing. And what that has to do, you have to look at everything as a case by case basis. And what you have to do is you have to balance the need for punishment with the need for rehabilitation. And so what I think a judge has to do is have to dig into that person, dig into the reasons why, again, why that person committed these, these offenses, why they're in this situation. And then you have to fashion a sentence that is going to do some punishment, but it's also going to help them be rehabilitated. And so that's what I would do should I become a judge. The last thing I would say is that you also have to consider whether or not that person being out is going to harm themselves. And so you have to consider that person's uh, mental health condition at, at the moment and their substance abuse uh, status at the moment. And those two things are sometimes the reason why a judge might keep someone incarcerated to make sure they don't go back out 
and hurt themselves by doing something that they should not be doing. And so those are the things that out there have to be weighed when you determine whether or not someone should be incarcerated or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Armstrong. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, guys. <laughs> oh, appreciate it. Uh, looking at incarceration at a district court level, um, I think that it's it's already in play for the most part is, is looking at it. Um, a, a lot of times it's already probation is the first resort. Uh, that's been my experience uh, in this county, uh, even though the statute itself doesn't allow for it. I've always been told that probation is a privilege, not a right. But uh, for most part, this county is pretty good about putting probation first. Um, when, when incarceration really gets um, sentenced on people, uh, it comes when there's a violation. So they violated their probation and then the court has to make a determination of, hey, what are we going to do at this point? Are we going to now revoke that probation? Are we going to go um, and put them in jail and, and be done with that? Or are we going to give them another chance? And so I agree with Mr. Feaster. I, we have to look at the why. That's what it comes down to. Why did they violate? Um, is it because they, and what is the specific violation, right? Did they commit another crime? Uh, did they commit an assaultive crime? Did they commit a crime on that same victim, say in the chance or in the case of um, domestic violence? Did they violate because they didn't pay their fine? or they didn't test at community corrections? And why didn't they test? Is it because they can't afford $12 to test? Is it because they've lost their job, their housing? Um, did they have a relapse for substance abuse? Because when we all know recovery, it's, it's a long road. It's not just, you better never violate. We have to really look at that and say, can we, can we help this person? I, I know, I know they violated, but can we, can we give them another chance, give them a little bit more support? Um, also it, mental health issues. Sometimes people, um, their, their medications, either they stop taking it or it becomes ineffective or their levels are off. Um, so maybe they're not, they're violating because their, their mind isn't right. So, so there's, there's so many reasons why you have to look at that. Uh, another times uh, you want to do jail is perhaps they're facing another sentence somewhere else where they're maybe going to prison or going to face another um, jail sentence. Um, then you want to do a time concurrent sentence. Um, so again, every case is um, individualized and no box, uh, no one fits in one box. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to, to switch very briefly to the civil side, which didn't get that much attention to the Goodwin Voters Forum. Um, at a forum, at a, at a panel several years ago, sponsored by the Washington Dems, uh, with owners of local small businesses, um, one owner of a software engineering company mentioned his frustration at his inability to collect debts. That he said that for small businesses, the expense of collecting debts, even if they were tens of thousands of dollars, often can be quite serious, but people really jeopardize their businesses. They don't have such a large margin. Uh, the district court has jurisdiction over claims less than $25,000. Do you believe that this is in fact a significant problem? And if so, can the court play any role in helping to resolve it? And I'd like to start um, this round with Mr. Collis. Well, this gentleman hasn't been to me. Uh, would be my first answer because this is what one third of my practices is collections of debts for um, small businesses, et cetera. Uh, I'm in the district courts every single day all across the state. Uh, I've been from here to Iron Mountain and, and uh, been from Grand Rapids up to Sault Ste. Marie. So I, I've been in most of the courts and district courts in the state. But back to the question, first of all, when I do these cases, instead of doing it on an hourly basis, I'm doing it on a contingency fee, which means that there's no money that's paid except for the filing fees and court fees. Uh, so that's one way that he could reduce his uh, problems. And another thing is, is that he could also, uh, this is legal advice, but I'll, I'll put it out there anyways, is uh, put in a clause in his contract indicating that the prevailing party or that if, he, if there's a breach of contract that the losing side has to pay attorney fees. That's one other way to avoid that expense uh, of an attorney, at least even on an hourly basis. So I don't see it as much as a problem on the business owner side. One of my platforms actually has been, and, and consistently is because I sue on a number of small debts, two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 every single day. Um, and the problem is, is that individuals 
um, propers are faced with that very same problem. They have a case, and how many attorneys do you know that are going to defend hourly at three hundred dollars an hour for you know a small case like this? It, it's almost as much to pay for the attorney as to even win the case. And this is why I want to create a task force. No one is entitled to a court-appointed civil attorney. We're entitled by our constitution to a criminal def defense attorney, but not a civil one. And I think it's very important that people have access to an attorney, especially on the defense side, so that these people are not harmed. Because what happens is, is if, you know, go against me, some pro per, it's an unfair advantage already, and they don't know the court rules. They're held to the same standards as attorney, both for evidence and court rules. And eventually, most of the time, they lose because they don't know how to present their case or fairly present it. And I want to make sure that I get a task force in place to help these individuals, whether it's through the law school or something else, uh, so that these people can be lifted up and have a fair playing field. Uh, so it's very important that we do address this problem, as I indicated. Uh, but I, I think that business owners themselves have the ability to, to do some things to mitigate their own damages. It's, it's the small people that need help. Thank you, Mr. Collis. Mr. Fisher. Thank you. So as I stated earlier, uh, I was in private practice for 14 years. And that was a, uh, I was a small business where I was working largely with myself, and maybe one or two other staff people. And my practice was primarily based out of the Flint area, not a very wealthy area, not an area where a lot of people have a lot of resources. And so I would charge... Uh, you know, a fraction of the cost of what a lot of other attorneys would, would charge. And when I first went into practice, a person told me, uh, get everything you can get up front, because if you don't, you're never going to collect it on the back end. And, you know, that from a practical standpoint made sense because you don't want to have to go suing your clients after the fact to go collect the money. But when somebody was really in, in need and in help and needed help, I would, you know, say, give me a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit next month and so on and so forth. And I would often never get that little bit next month, that, that little bit down the road. So the problem that the person speaks about is a real problem because it's hard to be able to collect those small sums of money. It's going to cost most people a fortune to go to court, hire a lawyer, hire you know, somebody to go and argue this case for them. And the situation is one that's you know, unavoidable when you're dealing with a small business trying to find its way, grow its business. They're going to have to, you know, extend some credit and people will owe them. The way I think we can address it best is to work with programs like the Dispute Resolution Center and other programs and try to get uh, people to go into mediation where they're able to uh, have the person, the debtor and the person who uh, the creditor come together and try to work out payment plans and resolutions to be able to address those issues. But the fact is that, yes, it is a real problem. And the court system needs to try to come up with some ideas and some ways to try to help those people so that they can keep their business afloat. Because I personally know how difficult it, difficult it can be. And so the problem really does exist. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Feaster. Um, Ms. Armstrong. I muted myself this time. Thank you. Um, so uh, prior to working at the prosecutor's office, one of my jobs was with a civil debt collection firm. And that's what I what I did. Um, we had several clients, several businesses, um, normally one major client. But yes, we would, I think uh, the fee was from a contingency basis, right? If we didn't collect, we didn't get a fee, but it was a, it was a smaller percentage. Um, the issue is, is, I thought the issue, the bigger issue, other than the legal fees, really was it's hard to collect. If you're collecting on a debt, it's because that person didn't pay the bill and they probably didn't pay the bill because they don't have the money or the funds or the property or what have you um, to pay that bill. And that's where it comes down to is, uh, and, and we would do a lot of, the only way to collect once you get that judgment, uh, and a lot of times it was very quick, it was motions for summary disposition. It was normally very clear that a debt was owed, debt wasn't paid end of story. Um, but collecting was the issue. So we would do wage garnishments, um, uh, tax refund garnishments, uh, but you're constantly going to court because people are fighting that because that tax or wage garnishment was 25% of, of your take-home pay um, of your of your paycheck. Um, and then your, I would be in 36 district court in front of eight different judges running up and down stairs um, trying to hold up these, these wage garnishments. Um, that, that was the biggest issue was this slow moving, trying to collect um what the court can do um 
I think if they refer to the Washington County Bar Association, because they have a referral list of attorneys uh, that would take on these cases and potentially um, do it not on an hourly basis, do it on a contingency basis to kind of cut down on fees. If they're going to be pro se, have a list of the of the forms they need to, to fill out, the SCAO forms. Um, you can't really give legal advice, um, but giving, giving pro se litigants the patients, um, communicating with them um, so that they can have um, fundamental fairness, essentially, in litigation. Um, I would also encourage uh, civil attorneys uh, with our bar association to put on these, put on maybe some free seminars uh, to assist small business owners with learning how to collect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Barr. Thank you. I would agree the collection of debts is a problem. But in the example given, an owner of a software engineering company trying to collect a debt, I define that as a rich people problems. Software engineer, not to mention a company owner, on average would make double what myself or others in public service make. Some of you may recall Attorney General Frank Kelly and his work on consumer protection. Part of that work was the Michigan Fair Debt Collection Practices Act to protect consumers from overreaching debt collectors. The law is a wonderful tool because I've seen privileged, rich collection firms collecting debts that they bought for pennies on the dollar and garnishing wages of folks who can least afford the loss of income and are just scraping by. I myself own a small company and I can file my own collection case without having to pay additional attorney fees. We only choose to do so if the client has obvious means to pay and most don't. I recently defended a woman who at the time was a small local business owner. Criminal charge was for felony non-sufficient funds checks that were written to the landlord of her business. At the time, she did not have the means to pay an up upfront retainer, but begged me to accept two Rolex watches, one which belonged to her deceased father, one which belonged to her mother. They were both older and worn um, as collateral because she promised she knew she could pay it off in a year. Well, that year passed three years ago. I took the watches to an Ann Arbor jewelry store and they said, oh, well, we'll give you $250 for the women's and $500 for the men's. And, and the contract allowed me to do that. But I was shocked at how little they offered. It sounded like what pawn shops would offer clients when they you know, have to sell an heirloom to uh, try and save themselves. Well, the woman called me about a month ago as her mother passed away. She had lost her business, was working 10 to 12 hours a day for cash because of the creditors chasing her, trying to collect debts. She had a quarter of a million dollar judgment against her from her landlord and countless other judgments. But based on her overall circumstances, I canceled her debt to our firm, returned it her, her heirlooms and advised her to go to bankruptcy because she was working herself to death and that was the right thing to do. Uh, when I told her what I was going to do, she cried because she hadn't had any good fortune in quite some time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would again like to ask the attendees if anyone has a question for the candidates. I've got a few more, but um, if you wish to pose a question yourself, you should feel free to do so. Um, no hands are going up, so I will continue. Um, to what extent is it a problem that um, Defendants do not show up in court. Um, is, is this a challenge? And what can the court do to respond to that? And here, I think we start with, go to my list, um, Mr. Feaster. Thank you. Uh, it's not uncommon for defendants to not show up in court. Uh, it happens for a variety of reasons. Uh, sometimes they just don't want to come. Sometimes they don't understand the technology. Sometimes they get mixed up with the date. Sometimes they're working, uh, you know, long hours and they oversleep. But it's definitely something that we all come across on a daily basis. As a defense attorney, I think that uh, we do our best to try to work with the, with the client and the court to get them to court to clear up any potential warrants that might come uh, before them and to make sure they're able to have their day in court. Oftentimes that person will get a warrant for failure to appear and they'll show up in court one way or another, but behind bars. And so I think we have to do uh, a, a good job of trying to understand the different circumstances that people are coming from when they come to court. When we first started Zoom court, uh, there were a number of people uh, who I work, represented who didn't understand Zoom. They didn't understand the technology. They didn't understand how to get on. And a lot of judges did not, did not appreciate 
that some of our older population and some of our population without computers just couldn't do it. And so I think it was very impressive that, that the district court, and I think Judge Simpson was someone who, who helped lead that charge, was they created access points at the different court systems across the county so that people could come to the courthouse and get on Zoom and be able to have their day in court. And so those are the kind of things we have to do to help people. We have to think outside the box and make sure we're accounting for not just the majority, but the people on the fringes who also need the help and who need somebody in the court system thinking about their struggles. And so I'm thankful that the court did that and we have to be mindful of those things moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Feaster. Um, Ms. Armstrong. Thank you. Um, the, it does happen that we have people that don't show up for court. Um, and I think that the judge needs to just take a moment instead of immediately issuing a bench warrant and, and talk to their attorney, talk to the parties and see if there is an immediate um, risk uh, for that person to themselves or to other people. Um, is there a history of a failure to appear? And that's going to influence your decision. But there's a lot of things that a judge can do without issuing the bench warrant immediately. And, and that's important because so if there's a bench warrant out there, that person can't just show up at court again. They have to turn themselves in. They have to go to jail and be arraigned again on that bench warrant. So it is a, a consideration. So when are they going to turn themselves in? When are they going to get arrested? Are they speeding and they get a traffic stop and they're on their way to work? And now they're in jail for how many days? Um, are they losing income from that? And that's going to affect their housing and childcare and all the other things. So, again, there's a lot of things to take in consideration before issuing that bench warrant. Um, one thing you can do, though, as judge, is that you can issue a show cause instead. So that's going to put another court date on, on the record so that they have another chance to show up. Um, you can adjourn, adjourn the case. Give that defense attorney a, a chance to reach out to them, um, figure out where they are, um, see if they'll show up to the next date. Uh, another thing is delaying that bench warrant. Say, I'm going to issue the bench warrant, but it won't go you know, on lien for this many days. Give the defense attorney a, a chance again to speak to someone. I think that Zoom court has been huge um, for people when, it's, when there's things in place like access points. But it, if you're in Zoom court, then you don't have to miss a day of work. You can be at work while you're on Zoom on your phone. So you're not missing that time. You've got um, a five minute hearing maybe, uh, and you're not gonna miss a whole day of work if you can just um, be on Zoom on your phone. It's been amazing for people. And I've seen that a lot of more people are showing up because they don't have to deal with transportation issues. A lot of people don't have licenses or cars. And now they can come to court without having to figure out all of those things, figuring out childcare and trying to not lose your job because I got to miss a day of work because now I embarrassingly have to tell my boss that I've got this case pending. So I think Zoom court has been amazing for pretrial dockets. Um, so I, I, I think that some of the issues can be resolved with a judge that um, takes those considerations in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barr. Thank you. So in the question you indicated of defendants not show up in court, I assume we were referring to criminal defendants and not civil, although I'm not sure that, that it was stated. And with regards to criminal defendants, this goes back to our U.S. Constitution and the Due Process Clause. And that Due Process Clause says that everyone, when their rights are affected in the courts, have, are entitled to notice and an opportunity to be heard. So what the court should do with regards to someone that hasn't showed up? Well, the first thing is to qualify or determine whether or not they have received proper notice. And that is very important. And some people in the general public don't understand that that notice is typically derived from the, the address on your driver's license. And that if you move, the notice would go to the wrong place. And courts in the past have not been overly sympathetic because if your driver's license says that that's where you are, that's where the court notices have been. And in the past, typically, you don't show up. Um, and at the end of every criminal docket, there's always a dozen cases or so where people don't show up. And, and in the past, they would fairly routinely be issued bench warrants. Um, I believe Zoom has changed things. It's made a lot of things 
better by way of access to the courts, um, but it's also created technical issues for people to not be able to attend for those reasons. And because things have changed both societally and technologically, I believe much as Judge Frushauer has been doing is grant is giving many more chances for people to show up, giving them more notice to get there before issuing a bench warrant. And I do believe that is important. I furthermore would like is your next judge in the 14th district court to have a day a week for everyone that may have a bench warrant to can show up at, you know, that day, get the file pulled, clear their warrant and move things forward. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Mr. Collis. Well, the, the question as posed uh, essentially was people not showing up for court and, and are there a lot of bench warrants? And, you know, I've been practiced 26 years and as indicated by some of the others, that's part of the business, uh, unfortunately, in criminal defendants is that sometimes they don't show up in court. Now, I accept uh, court appointments when the public defender's office can't do that. And I'm one of very few, uh, only what, four or five attorneys, I think, right now that are on the capital list for Washtenaw County for accepting uh, court appointments. And one of the, the things that we've seen um, with Zoom court, of course, is that more people can participate and do participate. Now, they may not always be appropriately attired or they may be smoking or drinking or uh, naked, and I've seen Mr. Feaster laughing because we've all seen it, um, but they are coming. And, and I think that's really important because especially if you're paycheck to paycheck, you need every day you can to be on the job. And so bench warrants, you know, of course, are going to take you off the street. Uh, it's going to take you a lot uh, of, uh, away from, you know, your people that you loved, et cetera. And most of the time, even back before Zoom, it was because of simple things like they just needed to go to work. And so it is appropriate, I think, to give it a second opportunity. Now, as a person who takes uh, conflict uh, cases from the public defender's office, I I've noticed that uh, there are some issues in the public defender's office, and they're minor, but it, it, you know, their clerical staff still has issues getting email addresses, correct contact information, and that's human error. It's no malice in it. I mean, I get email addresses that are, you know, let, a few letters off here or there, a phone number that's off. And, you know, we try to contact them and we have to do extra due diligence to try and get in touch with these people, make sure they show up. Uh, but I think that's what's required of any attorney. We're advocating for our client. We have to get our clients there. We have to make sure that they're there. And um, that's part of our job. But there are certain people that just won't show up or they flee um because that's just what they want to do they're scared of the consequences or they don't want the consequences uh i've had people break tethers i've had people break bonds so people do do that uh but has it increased since uh, the invention of zoom no i'd say it's decreased uh and that most of the time when they don't show up it's usually something innocuous and i i think that technology has been a vast improvement for lowering the amount of bench warrants thank you Thank you very much, Mr. Collins. Uh, I have one last question, and then uh, unless questions are posed from the audience, uh, we'll turn to the final statements. So my last question is, would you please provide an example of a decision you made that illustrated what you consider a core value that you hold? And I believe now um, we're gonna start with Ms. Armstrong. Thank you. Uh, the core value that I have uh, that I picked today, but I also um, I use it every single day is integrity. Um, integrity is doing the right thing, especially when no one is looking. Uh, it's also one of the core army values. Um, I have a couple of different examples. I picked ones that are, are from uh, my work, essentially. Um, but this was, and I can't pick things that, I'm, that are open cases. But years ago, this was a misdemeanor case, and um, this the, the, this girl, I think, was 19 or 20, so she's eligible for HIDA, which is the Homes Useful Trainee Act, so it's a deferral program. It's going to make it a non-public record, keep it off keep it off of her record. Um, it was the best thing for her because it was a, it was a solid case. Um, the public defender and I um, spoke about it a lot, and um, uh, we kept adjourning it so that she uh, would get more opportunities to try to talk her about the, that option. And she didn't, she wanted her trial. So we, 
we said, okay. And even the morning of trial, I said, Hey, this is, this, this is the best option. I'm, we're going to, I'll leave it open. We'll leave it open. Sometimes prosecutors will revoke offers, right? If they have to set things for trial and, and, and everything, or it's the day of trial. Um, we did the trial. We're, we're about to get to closing. And uh, this was a bench trial. So the judge called us into chambers because he saw what was happening as well. And he said, what, what, what happened here? <laughs> we explained what happened. And he said, do you want to talk to her again? You know, Ms. Ms. Armstrong, will you be willing to stop and, and do this? And I said, yes, let's stop the trial and let her have it. I, let her have the height. That's the best thing for her. Um, also, in other cases, just um, speaking with an officer, an officer wanting me to not reduce things and then knowing a reduction will result in a deferral for a, a young person. And then this was a PWID case. I'm sorry. It's like the delivery of, of cocaine. Um, and they weren't going to get it off their record if I didn't reduce it to a possession. And, and so I did it, even though the officer didn't want me to, because it was the right thing to do. And that's what I think that I, I would do as judge is what I do as a prosecutor is doing the right thing in, in your cases. Um, and that's also when I did appeals work, um, Make, if I look at a case when I was in appeals and the defense was right, there was an error, um, then we have to concede error. Then we concede error, we overturn the conviction, and we do the right thing. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Barr. Thank you. In 2001, I made the decision to leave a lucrative job in the tax department of a large accounting firm in Oakland County to return and serve this community. I believe this shows that service, communicate, that service to the Ypsilanti community is my home and the 14A District Court is one of my values. I took a pay cut to come back and work in my community. Separately, my decision to remain in Boy Scouts and earn my Eagle rank and also enroll my son in Scouts is emblematic that I reflect the values of the Scout law. Scout law is that a Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. On another note, I would like to express a value, and in, in this action was not my own. It was a police officer of the Ypsilanti Police Department, and in the middle of trial, could not identify the defendant, who was clearly in the defendant's chair, but he honestly testified that he couldn't identify the defendant, and we dismissed the case right there. I believe there are honest police officers, as demonstrated by that, in my community. On yet another topic, while I cannot take a political position pursuant to the Michigan Code of Judicial Conduct, I would like to implore everyone who has not yet done so to read yesterday's MLive article titled, Listen to Black Women, How We Start to Fix Racial Inequities Exposed by Abortion Issue. I would like to mention a few statistics provided in that article. In 2021, black women accounted for 55% of abortion services in Michigan, despite black residents making up about 14% of the state's population, according to data from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Between 2014 and 2018, black women who continued with their pregnancies were 2.8 times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than their white counterparts in, RIP in Michigan. The fate of the babies are in similar con contrast. Five white babies younger than one died per 1,000 births in 2020 in Michigan. The black infant rate was almost three times higher with 10 uh, deaths per 1,000 live births, the state health department reported. Uh, thank you for the time. I hope the above, above information gives you some insight into my values, and I ask everyone to please vote for me for 14A District Court Judge. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Mr. Collis. Well, I struggled with this question. I, I know it was provided early and I, and because a great deal of the decisions that I make on a daily basis are protected by the attorney client privilege. And I thought about it some more. And what I came up with was my decision actually to run for judge. I have been an attorney for 26 years working every day, very hard for my clients. But the thing that always sticks out in my mind is why I'm doing this. I became a lawyer for the sole purpose of helping people. And I have been able to do that uh, many, many, many times, many, many clients. But the people that I'm able to help right now are this big. It's the people that retain me. It's the people that I'm appointed to. It's the people that I take on for pro bono for whatever reason. On the other hand, 
as a judge, I can affect society. I can make decisions that affect a great amount of people. And that amount of service, that value of service and being there for our community, I think it's probably the most core value that I have. Certainly as an attorney, I have the core values of honesty, integrity, truthfulness, all the things that we're sworn to uphold as an attorney. But when you put it all together, what it really relates to is service and serving our community. And that's what I believe is the most important thing for a judge in this county. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mr. Feaster. Thank you. Uh, as I stated earlier, I was in private practice for about 14 years. And much of that private practice was doing criminal defense work. And at that time, I was on a court appointed list where I took cases for people who couldn't afford to retain their own counsel. And uh, the, the example that I thought of is when the pandemic first hit, uh, the county I worked in wasn't as progressive as Washtenaw County, and uh, the judges were issuing bench warrants for people who were unable to get on Zoom and who were missing court dates. First appearance, bench warrant issued. And the court didn't have access points. It didn't have other ways for people to, to get on to the court hearings and to be a part of the, the court process. And the community was a, a com community that was a poor community. So people didn't have uh, computers and working cell phones and cameras and an elderly population that didn't understand a lot of technology. And so the court was just putting out bench warrant after bench warrant after bench warrant. And what I did was I went to the judges and I said, you know, we need to do something different than this. We can't put out bench warrants on everybody for missing a first court appearance during Zoom. I think we need to find another way to do it. Now, I, I didn't come up with the access point idea, which Judge Simpson did, which was a great idea. But I asked the judges, I urged them to come up with an idea for how we could help these people and avoid everyone getting these bench warrants. And when they refused, I went to the Bar Association and I spoke to the chair of the criminal defense bar. And I asked her to talk to the judges to try to move them in that direction. And when that didn't work, I emailed my colleagues on the appointment list and I asked them to call for the judges to find a way to be fair and equitable to these people with less means. And when no one else stood up with me, I stood alone. And what I did was I removed myself from the court appointed list. And that's a list where I made a good amount of money from. But I removed myself because I refused to be a part of a process that was unfair and that was biased to people who without means. And so that's the kind of thing that is a core value for me. We have to make sure that we treat everyone fairly, uplift the people who don't have things, and stand on those values. That's my character. That's the kind of person I am. And that's the reason why I chose that as my core value. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Schuster. Mm -hmm. I'm now going to give the attendees one last chance to ask a question. I see no hands going up, and therefore I'm going to ask the uh, panelists to make a closing statement. So you have two minutes, and Mr. Barr, you're first. Thank you. I would again like to remind everyone of my longstanding roots and ties in the community, very deep, going from growing up, you know, as well as working for and in the community for the last 22 years. My experience working for the city, standing before city council, drafting and passing ordinances through the city. My work at the Gateway Committee. The Gateway Committee was a citizen initiated committee on the south side of Ypsilanti to solve the problems on Harriet Street. And those problems, after a detailed study, some students of, of Eastern Michigan University put together based on where the calls were in the city. And for those that don't know, the city is relatively small, 4.4 square miles. And the vast, vast majority of the, uh, the offenses with regards to drugs, alcohol, gambling, and prostitution were along that corridor. And so through that committee, based on the request and wishes of the community, we created a conditional bond request zone where we're a very measured zone if someone was arrested there, particularly if they didn't live there for one of those named offenses as part of their bond, they could not return to that area. Now, the best part of that program is based on the copious communication, the community meetings, notifying, let everyone know the collaboration between the community, the judicial system, which included the prosecutor, the public defender, NAACP, they're all invited, 
um, and the courts that arrests were not needed to fix the problem. It's that type of community support, collaboration, and frankly, the trust and the confidence of the community that I seek to bolster as your next judge in the 14th A District Court. I thank you, Eli, for the putting this panel together and moderating through all the difficulty with the bombers or whatever they're called, creating the problems. No, none of us, you know, need that. And you handled it excellently. Um, and Crystal, I'm sorry that someone interfered with, with your time. Uh, if, I ask everyone to please review the Women League of Voters. There is the video. There's also an article they had out on MLive that has great synopsis. And please, after thoughtful review and consideration, vote for me for your next 14A district court judge. If you want to learn more, my number is 734-218-4582. My website is carlbarforjudge.com. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mr. Collis. Well, God, I'm mute. That helps, doesn't it? Uh, um, in terms of what 14A needs, 14A needs a judge who is familiar with all the aspects of what this court covers. When it comes to that, if you look at all the other candidates, not only am I the most experienced, but I am the only one that can do that for this community. I do practice landlord tenant. I do practice traffic. I do practice in small claims and have written articles about the small claims process. I do practice civil under 25,000. I do practice misdemeanors and I do do felonies on a daily basis. No one else can boast the resume that I have. I'm perfect for this position. I hope that the community will agree for, with me. On top of that, I am the only candidate who is uh, a, a mediator and is on media, mediation lists in Jackson County, Washtenaw County, Oakland, well, not anymore in Oakland County. I still think I'm on Livingston and Wayne, but I may or may not, and have been appointed cases to mediate. So I have experience not only in the court system as a litigator, but I also am trusted to do mediations for judges around the state. I think it's important when people look at the candidates to know that that judge is going to be able to handle any matter that comes before them. And again, that would be me. 26 years of experience, have a background in every single thing that the 14A District Court does. I'm pro sobriety court, pro mental health court. I want to make sure that this community thrives. Therefore, I would hope that everyone here would vote for me on August 2 and of course then again on November 8th. I thank you for your time. Eli, again, thank you for putting this together. Uh, my website, electstuartcollis.org, or my Facebook is, uh, again, electstuartcollis. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Feaster. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the uh, Washington County Democratic Party for hosting this forum. Thank you all for having me and for giving us the opportunity to uh, touch the voters and explain to them why uh, we think we're good candidates. Obviously, uh, I'm running for this position because I believe that I can make some great change in the justice system. Uh, the entire reason why I went into law was to try to make a difference, to move society forward and to make sure we could help people. I have a vision for the 14A District Court. I have a vision that is sometimes a little bit outside of the box in terms of the things that we can do to help people. But I think that's what we have to have. If you look at our society now, the school to prison pipeline, the number of incarcerated people we, have, people we have in our prison system, I think we can say that the system is not working in the best way for our society. And we need to be able to find ways to touch people in different ways and to break down these systematic, uh, systemic issues that are causing these problems in our society. And so I believe that I can do that. I have uh, created specialty courts in the past. I have worked with our youth in the past and continue to work with our youth. Mm -hmm. I believe in a different way of providing justice, a different way of touching people mm -hmm. and addressing the underlying issues. Like I said, mental health, substance abuse, lack of education, lack of employment. We gotta treat our kids like kids and do the things that we need to do to move our society forward. Continuing the status quo is not what's gonna be best for this county. It's not what's best for our state. It's not what's best for our country. So I ask that you please consider voting for me on August 2nd. I believe I'll make a great judge and I'll do some great things here. You can reach me at feasterforjudge.com. You can also call me on my cell phone, 734-480-8131. 734-480-8131.
Thank you again for having me. And it was great to be here with the, with the panel. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Ms. Armstrong. I want to thank again the Washington County Democrats for this panel. And thank you, Eli. Um, I'm Fawn Armstrong running for 14A District Court Judge. We have a legal system in place, but it is a flawed system. And it only gets better if we have people in positions of power that have the sufficient legal knowledge and experience and also the heart and the caring to make it better. I have 10 years of prosecutorial experience in this county. I've practiced in all of the courts here, specifically when I was in district court and also doing exams at least six years in 14A courts. And that's as the prosecutor, I'm the one that's there several days a week doing the entire docket, doing multiple bench trials a day where other attorneys might have one. I'm doing the bulk of those cases and that experience is invaluable. It is. I've done three years of appeals at the prosecutor's office as well, and that's deep diving into precedent, figuring out the why, um, practice in the court of appeals, filing things, um, Michigan Supreme Court. I'm also licensed in the United States Supreme Court as well. I've also been had experience as a prosecutor in the specialty courts that we do have already here. An experienced judge is so necessary because the orders and decisions that that judge makes seriously impact people's lives. And if you have that experience of seeing these cases and these factors that play into it, then you're going to be able to make decisions. And that's, it's just key to, to having a just court. I've been rated, um, highly rated by women lawyers. I'm also endorsed by the AFL-CIO, uh, several judges and attorneys as well, uh, retired Judge Shelton, Judge Outside, Referee Altenberg. I have people on my website, but I, I just hope um, if my message, if my values resonate with you, then you will vote for me on August 2nd. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Armstrong's statement concludes this evening's um, pair of panels. I want to thank all of the panelists for participating. It's a very important part of our democratic process that the voters get a chance to hear you in person, to, to see how you express yourself, to see how you respond to a range of questions, and you've been willing to put yourself out there to the public to expose yourself. And that's, that's a great public service for all of us. And I'm very grateful. I think I'm, I speak on behalf of the Washington Democratic Party when I say that. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Wow. And I think, and we forgot to thank the timekeeper. Great job. Thank you, timekeeper. <laughs> thank you, Madam Timekeeper. <laughs> that that, that, that bell was a little disconcerting, but we appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye, Crystal. Bye, everybody.